Here are seven simple tips to improve your game and help make you a winning player in low stakes poker. Before I get into the main content, uh, just a little bit of viewer discretion. Firstly, this channel is not a poker training or coaching channel. Um, it was never meant to be and uh, I don't plan to be. There are a lot of other channels and online resources that are dedicated to that kind of thing. This channel, like a lot of other poker vloggers, I share my own sessions and poker journey and my own thought process on my hands. I always hope you guys gain something from it, whether it's entertainment or just hanging out, or if you feel like it, chiming in with your own input on how I played certain hands. And of course, if you feel like you learned something from, from the, my videos that you can apply to your own game, that's always wonderful. That being said, one of the most common questions I've received from you guys is in some variation or form, I've been asked to give advice or tips on how to win at uh, low stakes poker, which would be one, two or one, three. I'll apologize to those of you who've asked me because I haven't really responded to you in a really direct manner, mostly because of what I just mentioned. And I've kind of just referred you guys to some other resources that I've consumed and I do generally believe were helpful to me. Uh, those would include Bart Hansen's uh, Crush Live Poker, Upswing Poker, some of uh, Doug Polk's stuff, uh, the book uh, Modern Poker Theory, uh, as well as some of uh, Jonathan Little's material. I'm going to link to all that stuff in the description. And yeah, I'm not affiliated with any of them in any way. So this episode will be an outlier. Uh, instead of sharing a poker session or two, I'm going to share with you guys some tips, more like strategies that I've utilized that have transformed me from a casual recreational break-even player to um, more consistently winning 1-3 player. Some of these strategies don't exactly align with GTO, but they are what work for me. And I have no reason to believe that they will not work for you. Just some more discretion. These are strategies targeted at low stakes, live poker, and naturally the region that I play at, which is um, Greater Vancouver. I don't think that last part matters too much because I do believe that these strategies are generally applicable to any card room. Also, poker is a metagame that is constantly evolving. For example, optimal strategy 15 years ago is actually very different from what's optimal today. So while these strategies have been very effective for me in this era, it's up to you guys to stay up to date and constantly assess and adapt. This is the format of this episode. As I go through and elaborate on the strategies I'm going to share one by one, I'm also going to show an example of an actual hand that I played in a 1-3 game that kind of demonstrates the strategy in action. Uh, this hand will be a clip pulled from one of my previous episodes. So if you're a returning viewer, it might be familiar to you. All right, let's get to it. Number one, look for more optimal bluffing spots to bluff. Please do not confuse this with simply bluffing more or uh, blindly bluffing more often. This is not what I'm telling you. In fact, if you are already bluffing a lot, it might mean for you to cut back a little. But most people don't bluff enough at these stakes and I want to tell you what it means to find good bluffing spots. Here's a checklist to work with. So what you want to do is, firstly, make sure your story makes sense. That means before you pull the trigger on a bluff, review in your head the actions, uh, the betting line, pre-flop, all the streets so far, and make sure it aligns with the story you're trying to tell. For example, uh, a story that does not make sense is, let's say you were um, in a hand with an opponent and you flop the flush draw. The opponent keeps betting into you and and you just call every street going for the flush draw. Pretty straightforward so far. But at the end, 
everything breaks out, you miss everything, and you decide to go for this bold bluff on the river with either a big bet or an all-in jam. So this does not make any sense at all. Sometimes it might work, but if your opponent had was decent or had any kind of ability to rationalize, these illogical lines will get sniffed out a lot. So make sure your story makes sense. The next one is have good blockers. This means that your hand blocks some of the combos that you want to represent. An example of this would be, let's say on an ace high board and you wanted to represent ace king or ace queen. If you had a hand like king queen, that would actually be very good for that. Um, or if you want to represent a flush draw that hit a flush, um, if you had yourself one of the cards that of that suit, they would actually help a lot. Next is have good scare cards on the board that benefit your range. A common example would be, let's say you were the preflop raiser and an opponent calls. An ace comes on one of the streets, so who would this card help? In a straightforward example like this, it would be you as the preflop raiser. It doesn't really matter if you have an ace or not, but that ace is usually more of a scare card to the opponent. Unless, of course, you are playing like a maniac and raising every hand and have no credibility. But anyways, the point here is to learn to recognize in different scenarios what are good scare cards that benefit you. Next is targeting the right opponent. A common blunder back in the day is people trying to bluff off players that are new to the game or just still learning the game. They think that because a player is new, uh, he or she would be easier to outplay or bluff. Oftentimes, it's the exact opposite. Because a common mistake that newer players make is that they overvalue a lot of their hands and end up uh, making very loose calls. So that's not as common nowadays to run into um, new players uh, at a 1-3 table in a card room. But good targets to bluff against would be tighter players, uh, players who have shown they're at least somewhat logical, or shown they're capable of folding big hands. If there are players you see that show tendencies to call down a lot or are capable of hero calling, well, you might want to avoid pulling big bluffs uh, against those types. And against a new player, I would recommend just not even attempting to bluff at all. So out of this list, the more you can check off, the better your bluff is. If you only check three out of four, it's still good, but not optimal. When you only hit two out of four or one out of four, then it gets uh, more dicey. And if you don't check any of these at all, I would say it's probably a bad bluff to attempt. If you find yourself in a situation where all these boxes check out, then I would say it's an optimal bluffing spot and you should always try to actively seek out more of these spots. Here is an example hand. This hand, I pick up king queen on the button. There are four limpers and I raise it to $25. Everyone folds except for the hijack. It's heads up into a flop of 10-7-6 with two clubs and one diamond. The villain checks. Not a good range for me, so I check back. The turn is the five of diamonds. The villain now bets $15. With just two overs and a king high, my hand doesn't have much showdown value or equity at all. However, I look at the board and see that there are two flush draws out there that matches the two suits of my hand. At these stakes, players' bet sizes often align with the strength of their hands, so the villain doesn't seem very strong now. I think any of the flush draws completing can allow me to rep a flush on the river. In addition to any club and diamond, there are also a lot of potential four-card straights on the river that I can bluff with. I call with the sole intention of bluffing if a good scare card hits. The river is the jack of diamonds. The villain checks. This is almost the perfect scare card. The diamond completes the flush, which I block. The jack is an over card to the 10, and my king-queen blocks a lot of jack combos as well. I follow through with my plan and slide in $100. The villain thinks for a bit and folds. Number two, go for thin value more often. Going for thin value means value betting against a hand that is slightly worse than yours when your own hand is not necessarily that strong. A situation that happens a lot at these stakes is 
a player would have a hand like top pair or second pair with a good kicker, and the board runs out at the river, it gets checked to him, and then he just checks it down. He's thinking, I'm probably good here. Uh, if I bet, it's not like worse hands will call. So he's happy to check and take the pot down. Oftentimes, this is when missed value happens because with the right bet sizing, they don't actually, they don't realize that they can get called by third or fourth pair or same pair, weaker kicker, but they're happy to win the pot so often that they end up missing a lot of value. Here is an example hand. This hand, I pick up ace nine on the button. Under the gun straddles for $6. There are three limpers and I also limp. The big blind calls and under the gun checks his option. It's six way to a flop of ace queen deuce with two hearts. Everyone checks to me. Typically multi-way, I would be more cautious, but in a limp pot, I think my top pair with the middling kicker is in the lead most of the time. There is a flush draw out there and I do have one heart blocker. I bet $15 to get value from all draws and weaker aces. Under the gun calls and the cutoff calls. The turn is the five of clubs. Everyone checks to me again. The flush draw doesn't complete and I still beat a lot of aces. So I continue to bet for value. I bet $45. Under the gun tanks for a little while here. I was half expecting him to check raise, but he ends up just calling. The cutoff folds and gets out of the way. The river is an offsuit eight. The villain checks once again. I think for a moment here if there's any merit for a value bet. Checking back and going to showdown with top pair, I think is fine. There are two missed flush draws on the board, but since the suits of my hand blocks both, it's slightly less likely the villain was on a flush draw. So does he have any value hand that loses to mine is the question. On the turn, the villain took a bit of time to make a reluctant call. I feel like he has a weaker ace, but I think the turn card is something that helped him. My gut feeling is that he has ace three or ace four, so he doesn't feel too great calling my bets, but picked up extra equity on the turn with a gut shot straight draw. I decide to go for a value bet that targets that hand. I bet $60. The villain tanks for a while and then calls. We table our hands. The villain shows ace four and I take this one down. All right, number three. This next tip is probably gonna be the most controversial one. It's value bet small on the river. If you look up GTO strategy, solvers, or seek out tips from anyone else, you'll probably be told to polarize. You should value bet big and balance that out with bluffing big as well. And yes, for the most part, this is proper strategy, except when targeting low stakes. At least for most of the 1-3 games I've played in, in general, especially on the river, players usually under bluff and over fold. So if big polarizing bets, uh, value bets, just end up folding out hands that can call you most of the time, you're better off betting smaller to get more crying calls. This is what I've found to be more profitable in the long run at these stakes. And I do think that being balanced at these stakes is a bit overrated. It's not something you usually have to worry about. Um, unless you're playing in the same card room with a small player pool, same people all the time, that's when it matters more. Otherwise, just don't worry about it. Focus on finding more value spots and realizing that value, even if it means betting smaller. Here is an example hand. This hand, I pick up 10 jack of hearts at the cutoff. Under the gun plus one opens to $16 and everyone folds to me. I contemplate three betting here, but the open is from a pretty early position with a pretty strong sizing as well. So I just call to take this hand to the streets, which plays really well post flop in position and also a hand that I don't mind inviting a multi-way pot. The big blind also calls. It's three way to a flop of queen king six with two clubs. The big blind checks and the pre-flop aggressor C bets for $25. I have an open ender here in position, so it's a pretty easy call for me. The big blind folds. The turn card is the nine of hearts and I hit the nut straight. The villain checks. 
Although there is a flesh draw possibility out there, I really don't think the villain has it. Him leading out for half pot multi way just seems like a hand that's not a draw. Likely a king with ace king or queen king. I'm pretty sure he's just drawing pretty dead here. I don't think my hand needs protection at all, and I want to get two more streets of value here, and I put him on a hand that would pay it off. I bet $45. The villain calls. The river is a jack of clubs. The villain checks again. One of the worst cards as the board completes the flush and puts out a four card straight. I'm certain I'm still good here, but the card is just an action killer. I don't think I can go for a big bet anymore if I want to get paid. I don't think polarizing bets work that well in these stakes. I decide to make a small value bet that targets one pair or two pair that will make a crying call. I bet $40. The villain tanks for a while and calls. I show my hand and he mucks. Number four, be more aggressive with high equity drawing hands. High equity drawing hands would be something like flush draw with a pair, um, straight draw with a player uh, with a pair, uh, flush draw plus straight draw, combo draws. You get the idea. Don't be shy to lead out raise or even check raise. By doing this, you're creating more ways for you to win the hand beyond just counting on hitting your draw. You can make your opponents fold better hands, um, that's uh, taking advantage of fold equity. You can also tell a better story should you choose to bluff in the end if you do miss, because you've represented strength previously. Remember, having a convincing story is one of the things that make a good bluff. So here is an example hand. This hand, I pick up 6-7 of spades in the big blind. There's a button straddle of $5. The small blind folds, I call for an extra $2. Under the gun plus one calls, the cutoff calls, and the button checks. It's four way to a flop of jack queen six with two spades. Very good flop for me with a pair and a flush draw. But out of position, multi way, I'm never leading out. I check. Under the gun plus one bets $15. The cutoff and button folds. The action is back on me and it's now heads up. I'm never folding here, but I do have the option of calling or raising. I decide to go for the more aggressive route, so I can also take advantage of some fold equity. Also, a check raise in this spot, which was initially 4-way, reps a lot of strength. I raise it to $45, and the villain folds. Number 5. Be more aggressive pre-flop. This next one is a rather common one you'll hear. Um, yeah. So be more aggressive pre-flop, widen your range, especially in later positions. Always enter a pot raising instead of limping, and 3-bet more. In fact, try to stay away from playing unraised pots. One of the reasons that 1-3 or 1-2 is tough to beat is because of the expensive, uh, expensive rake. If the pots you win are mostly relatively small, that is when you're paying the most rake. What you want to do is either play and win bigger pots and also win preflop because uh, in most card rooms, I believe, uh, preflop hands that get taken down, they don't cost, they don't have any rake. And for this one, I don't have a good clip to show uh, because hands that don't go beyond the flop, uh, they don't usually make the cut. So uh, I'm going to show you some photos of a few chip stacks from when I was doing well in a 1-3 game. You will see something in common here. That is, there's an unusually big stack of white chips. These are uh, $1 chips. The reason you see this is because I'm raising a lot pre-flop, usually 3-betting more often than others at the table, and just taking down the blinds often. So hence, accruing a lot of white chips. Number 6. Overfold especially against river bets and pre-flop 3 bets. At these stakes, players tend to be tighter, but on top of that, stack depths are usually more shallow, so 3-bet ranges are just so narrow. That's why if you widen your 3-bet range, it works a lot to take down pots, but when you're faced against a 3-bet, it usually means aces, kings, or queens. I've seen a lot of ace-kings just limp or flat call. Even if you want to set mine, a lot of the times 
the stack depths don't even justify the odds, especially with um, a three bet preflop. So unless you have a really good read on a player, or if you have a premium yourself, just stay away from three better uh, preflop. Same idea with large river bets. Since the tendency is that players under bluff at these stakes, uh, when they bet strong on the river, it does lean towards strong or nutted hands. So again, unless you have a really, really good read, in general, overfold. Here is an example hand. This hand, I pick up ace-queen at under the gun plus one. There's a button straddle to $6. Everyone folds to me. I raise it to $20. The middle position folds. The low jack, who only has a total of $180, Decides to 3-bet to $75. Everyone folds and the action is back on me. The villain is basically pot committed with his entire stack here. With 3-bet ranges that are so narrow at these stakes, basically only hands that dominate mine. And not to mention, if I do call $75, I'll be priced in to call off the rest. This is just an easy fold. I let it go. The villain flashes pocket kings to me. Well played, sir. Number seven, fast play, strong, or made hands. If you flop a made hand, uh, such as flushes, straight sets, or even uh, top two pair or something like that, don't try to get too fancy and slow play. I think check raising the flop is the most slow playing I would do at these stakes. When you're against uh, tendencies of players of being passive, under bluffing, and not going for thin value enough, then slow playing strong hands will not help you maximize value. For this example hand, I'm actually going to show you a hand that I didn't follow my own advice and ended up missing value. I was immediately unhappy with how I played it, so the hand you're about to see is what I'd recommend you to learn not to do. This hand, I pick up pocket fours in the big blind. There are four limpers, the small blind calls, and I check. It's six-handed into a flop of queen nine four rainbow. The small blind checks. Awesome flop for me, hitting bottom set. I decide to just lead out here and hope someone has a queen to pay me off. I bet $15. Under the gun calls, and plus one calls. Everyone else folds. It is now three-handed. The turn is another queen. Perfect card with two callers on the flop. Someone for sure has a queen and maybe both of them do, which would be the dream spot. I decide to check here, since Trip Queens is going to be betting for, sh for me for sure. Under the gun bets out $95, which isn't too surprising. What is slightly surprising is plus one making the call. Now, I'm just thinking what's the best way of getting all the money in by the river. I look at everyone's stack. The villain directly to my left has less than $100 left, and I don't think there is any scenario that he doesn't get everything in, as he most likely has the queen. The other villain stack is a bit deeper, though I don't quite remember how much he had. Anyways, I'm thinking of the best way to get as much of that as I can. If I check raise here, especially with one cold caller, it's repping so much strength. I decide to just call. The plan is check the river, let the short stack go all in, and if the other villain cold calls again, I can raise for max value. The river is an ace. I follow through with my plan and check. The short stack, for some reason, decides to check. And the villain last to act, he also checks. What a disaster. I missed out on so much value. I table my hand knowing I'm good, but I was actually tilting because of how horribly I played this hand. In fact, I was so mad at myself that I took a small break to walk off and record a brief voice memo of how I was feeling. And I hope you found these tips to be useful. Please feel free to chime in with any tips of your own that you want to share that have worked for you. If you enjoyed the video, please remember to like and subscribe. It helps out a lot. Thank you for watching and I hope you look forward to the next.